Good evening, Brian, and welcome along to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our 87th lockdown lecture in this series of Masonic daily advancement education sessions during the COVID-19 pandemic. As ever, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all along here uh, this Tuesday evening. Bern, as ever, can I please remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines and when it comes to Zoom meetings, please keep your video rolling. Uh, unless you have serious bandwidth challenges, switch off the video, drop me a little message in the chat and I'd be much appreciated. Uh, please also have a recognisable name uh, in the, the little name box in front of you. Uh, again, that also helps our secretary when we're looking at the tile and I'd encourage you all to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages. Thank you so much, Bren. Well, Bren, it's uh, we're coming into the, the height of winter and uh, we're seeing all the different types of weather. So I thought we'd bring some sunshine into our lives, uh, a little bit Masonic sunshine. And I, I met this brother, I, Dimitris Papa Giorgio, I, James, because I, Dimitris is James uh, in Scottish. And I, he, I, I met him through the Internet Lodge. He's a, a member of the Internet Lodge uh, under the United Grand Lodge of England. And he, he told this story about Freemasonry in Corfu when it was a, a British protectorate. And I thought, that's a fascinating story that the members here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi Lockdown Lecture Series would love to hear. So without any further ado, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to welcome Brother Dimitris Papagiorgio to the Lockdown Lecture Series. Uh, the floor, the virtual floor is yours, James. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to thank everybody for being here today. Um, uh, indeed, uh, Brother Gordon, it's my pleasure presenting you this uh, uh, small paper to you. And um, I sent my fraternal regards from uh, Athens to Scotland, uh, which is one of my, <laughs> really, I, I can say, of my favorite countries. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever been to Corfu Island, which is indeed has a, a deep Masonic history. And um, during the lockdown, I had the chance to be on the island because uh, my ancestors come from this island. I do have a summer residence there. And I had the chance to retrieve um, some um, useful information about how Freemasonry was um, expanded on the island and later on to uh, Greece. And what was the impact of those first Freemasons that were inhabitants of the island. Uh, to begin with, a few things about Kopfu. Uh, Um, in, in, in Byzantine Greek, the word korifé uh, uh, means a peak, a summit. And uh, the, Byzantine, the Byzantine word korifó means the city of the peaks. Um, thus, uh, the name was given to the island because of the twin peaks of the town's old Venetian fortress. As you can see here, uh, these are the two peaks. Uh, this is the first one, and the other one. And these are the twin peaks of the fortress. Uh, so Corfu was the Italian version of Corifo, and so that became the name used worldwide. Um, the island of Corfu lies at the northwest edge of uh, Greece. And um, because of its geostrategical um, place, it came under Venice's sphere of influence due to the gradual uh, decline of the Byzantine Empire. The long period of Venetian rule from uh, nearly four centuries, uh, 1386 to 1797, had a profound impact on the island's identity. So uh, due to its strategic location in the Adriatic Sea, the city of Kofu, served for many centuries as an important administrative center, both 
as a strong naval base for the Venetian fleet and as a major trade port, while it was also protected by two impressive fortresses. During these centuries, Kofu was a meeting ground for different cultural traditions. The dominant Greek Eastern Orthodox community coexisted with Catholic and Jewish communities. It's leaving its mark in the language, the customs and practices of the people. At some point after the founding of the first Italian lodge in Florence in 1731, uh, Freemasonry was imparted as a natural consequence in the Venetian provinces, such as that of Corfu. Um, recently, I discovered in the archives of the National Library of Paris uh, that there was a, a lodge, a lodge, uh, Bienfaisance et Philogenie Reunie, and uh, I, I have a photograph of the founding warrant of the first lodge, which was officially founded in Corfu at the end of the 18th century. Um, in this picture, we can see uh, a Masonic certificate of Pasquale Melesione, an Italian nobleman, which was issued on the 29th of October, 1810. That you can see, it says here, it's uh, the or, um, in nome sotto gli auspici degli Orienta di Francia, it's uh, under the auspices of the Grand Orient of uh, France and uh, the Grand Orient of Italy. Unione Forza Salute, it means Union, Force and Solitudine. So this was from the 19th October uh, 1810, back then. Uh, in other words, um, the grandmother Scottish Lodge of Verona, based in Padova in Italy, approved and ratifies the request for the foundation of the Beneficenza Lodge with retroactive effect from the date of the request, 30th August of 18, 1781. A few years later, in 1789, a revolution breaks out and in uh, 1797, Corfu passes from the Venetian to the French control. Uh, when the, the Treaty of Campo Formio in 1797 dissolved the Republic of Venice, they were annexed to the French Republic for two years. Then uh, we have the foundation of the Repubblica Septinsulare, the, the, um, the Seven Islands, a Republic of the Seven Islands, uh, which lasted for eight years from 1800 to 1807. Uh, so it was a free state of the Ionian Islands. It was the first independent Greek area in the modern history. Uh, at the time, Corfu brothers, for obvious reasons, they should limit the communication among themselves and the relations with the Italian mother lodge, and at a certain point, all Masonic lodges on the Ionian Islands became inactive. In 1809, the Ionian Islands, again, were occupied by the French this time, under the first French empire uh, of uh, French military command of Napoleon, and the short-lived French lodges Saint Napoleon consecrated on the island was the main Masonic element in this period. Uh, later on, with the Treaty of uh, Paris of November the 5th, 1815, the Ionian Islands, after all the political changes that occurred with the departure of the French, were recognized as a free and independent state under the exclusive protection of Great Britain, who could completely intervene in the internal affairs of the state. So Kofu immediately after its delivery from the French military commander and uh, Freemason Francois Xavier d'Angelot to his fellow Scottish Mason, uh, General Sir James Campbell, made up the administrative center of the Ionian Islands and was the seat of the military forces. Its fortresses, like the other islands, were occupied by the British regiments, which now provided the defensive shield of the newly established United States of the Ionian Islands. Since 1732, when the first traveling military lodge was founded under the edges of the Grand Lodge of Ireland, in the first foot regiment, the Royal Regiment, 
of uh, the British forces and for the next two centuries, there was a common practice, particularly of the Irish, the English, and less of the Scots Masons, to set up lodges, chapters, and encampments within military units. These Masonic bodies were composed overwhelmingly of military personnel, with the exception, perhaps, of some political officials who served in the British forces or occasionally British citizens who were obliged to follow the missions of the units for long periods, either in military operations or in the British colonies and protectorates, such as those of the Ionian Islands. Uh, my recent year's research shows, as will be documented further on, that the presence of British military masons in the Ionian Islands uh, is inextricably linked to the early history of the Royal, Royal Arts and the Templar Masonry then. Uh, the spread of chivalry degrees in collaboration with those of the royal lords in the 19th century was due solely to the movements of these British military lodges, which were either being operated as royal arts lodges or had attached chapters, encampments, and councils. Uh, within the 48 British regiments of foot settled in the Seven Islands in the 50 years approximately of the English prote protection, we can identify at least 11 accompanied by military lodges, of which, however, only seven worked in craft degrees. Three of them worked the degree of the Royal Arts. These were the Hibernian Lodge number 42 of the 42nd Regiment of Foot, the Black Watch, during the period 1834 to 1836. Uh, Busato Lodge number 176 of the 88th Regiment of Foot, the Connaught Rangers during the period 1825 to 1836, and Royal Lodge Lodge number 510 of the 28th Regiment of Foot, the Gloucestershire Regiment during the period 1818 to 1829, all of them on the role of the Grand Lodge of Ireland. Um, I have to underline that the first two, Hibernia and Busaco, were the first to work the Templar degrees in Corfu in the period 1825 to 1821, while Busaco also worked other degrees beyond the craft, such as the Passingature, the Knight of the Temple, the Knight of Malta, Babylonian, Pass or Red Cross of Daniel, the Holy Royal Lords, Knight Templar Priest, and many more. A number 176 of the 88th Regiment of Foot, the Connaught Rangers, during the period 1825 to 1836, and uh, Royal Lords Lodge number 510 of the 28th Regiment of Foot, the Gloucestershire Regiment, um, were all under the, uh, the role of the Grand Lodge of Ireland, as I said before. Now, we should also mention that uh, there was the British Lodge, St. George number 304 and Integrity number 771, had attached anonymous Royal Lords chapters under the aegis of the Supreme Grand Chapter of the Royal Lords Masons of England. However, it is uh, doubtful that these royal arts chapters worked even once following their establishment as the members were scattered in various parts of the Ionian Islands, uh, thereby resulting in the lack of a quorum of the members. Uh, as indicated in this particular meeting of Corkira Union Band of the 16th of September, 1832, the following certificate uh, being the only known one of its kind was awarded to the Knight Templar priest John Tulson. Uh, the certificate that you see on the screen is also validated by six seals, two identical to the Royal Arts Lodge to the left and right at the top of it. Royal Arts Lodge, 88th Regiment, you can see here. Then uh, one of the Council of the Red Cross and one of the Knights Templar, left and right respectively. The Red Cross Council and the Knights Templar here. Uh, and two of the unit band, one red and one black of the ribbons on the left and right of the document. Uh, I retrieved uh, this warrant for this, from the archives of Phoenix Lodge from the 
Granos of Greece, and it's a certificate of uh, a nobleman, a, a Corfield nobleman, uh, Palatianos. Mr. Palatianos. And um, well, a few things about the, the, the first. This is a, a royal arts actor from Pythagoras. This is the from Palatianos, another warrant that I, I tried to achieve. It's a certificate of George Palatiano from Royal Art Chapter 654, meeting in Corfu called Pythagoras. So um, a few years later, in 1930s, in the 1930s, there was a petition to establish an English lord by some Corfuts. I will try to read um, a letter which was sent to back to England. In it says it reads in reference to your letter on the third March last, advertising to a former communication with a petition to the worship master, grand master, to establish a lord in your island. I beg have to state that the paper was placed in the hand of Brother White in order to be laid before the Duke of Sussex and by an arrangement of duties in the office. It is his province so to do and to communicate with the parties thereon. The application was duly submitted to His Royal Highness and understood him to have some doubt as to the propriety of this granting, the same in consequence of your island being under the government of Greece and subject to the Masonic authorities of that country. His Royal Highness wished to have time to consider and advise with some persons upon the subject. In the meantime, I consider uh, Mr. Wright had advised you upon the business. Should he not have so done, I deem it proper to observe that if the intended lodge is to be composed of British merchants and residents, it's not improbable that upon a representation of that fact, His Royal Highness may upon reconsideration of the case be inclined to acquiesce in the prayer thereof. In the event of it not being granted, you will be aware that the Grand Master is even actuated by desire to promote the general good. Brother A. M. Envoy from Kofu. So there was a desire from um, the, the, some people that were in the authorities of the uh, Islands and especially Kofu to have a neatly speaking lodge uh, under the aegis of the United Grand Lords of England, and not a military lodge, but a lodge in the premises of the town of Corfu. And luckily, on the 2nd of July, the 32, that was the petition, the, the, the warrant was obtained in 1837. And uh, the first worshipful master was uh, uh, we, we will see later on, Sir Matt Cotton, uh, he was uh, Justice of the Supreme Court of Appeal on the island of Corfu. This is a uh, summons from the Lodge of uh, Pythagoras. On Tuesday, 2nd March, 1857, being the regular monthly meeting, you are requested to attend the duties of your lodge and so on. This is also from the archives of Phoenix Lodge, number one under the uh, Grand Lodge of Greece. It's the coat of arms of the Ionian state. And a few things about the, the Kofu, which is still the, the capital of the Ionian state. So under the British protectorate, it had indeed preferential treatment. Uh, the fact of being the seat of the Senate, the parliament and the government administration, as well as a commercial center with a fleet that connected it regularly with the rest of the islands and also the permanent residence for the majority of the English officials uh, contributed to the island's significant growth during this period. 
Uh, the city of Corfu was adorned with magnificent buildings, public and private, while the partial demolition of the fortifications favored the city's expansion. Moreover, the imposition of sanitation and building rules resulted in the high level technical construction of the buildings and the improvement of the city's picture. Under the British protectorate, the city also acquires a new aspect. Then starts the formation of the Spianada, the space which the Phoenicians had left void in front of the old fortress for defensive reasons. On its north side, right on the spot of the Venetian military hospital, demolished by the democratic friends in vice regency style, the design and the supervision of the palace of St. Michael and St. George was assigned to the engineers, colonel, and lover of antiquity, uh, our brother, Sir George Whitmore. The result was a fully gratified, was fully gratified those who entrusted him with this project, indeed. And the palace of St. Michael and George, destined for sheltering public services, as well as for the habitation of the Lord High Commissioner, is constructed out of soft, blonde tuff of Malta, which gradually took the gray shade of the houses of the city. Uh, Sir Whitmore was also responsible for the first formation of the upper and lower square, as well as for the construction of the wonderful rotunda with the ionic columns on the upper square known as Metland's Rotunda. This is a, a neoclassical monument located at the end of the, this big square, Spianada in Corfu town. Uh, a few words about the order. The order was founded on the 28th of April 1818, the days of King George III, by the Prince Regent to the British throne, Prince George, the latter King George IV. It began as a small order that numbered only 45 knights and was mainly intended to honor prominent personalities of the Ionian Islands and Malta. Uh, although the weakness of the small order by numbers were recognized early on, the order remained confined and in its original Mediterranean sphere for 50 years until 1868, when it made the great leap that transformed it into one of the first rank orders of the United Kingdom. Since then, the order has gone through several phases, indicated of the changes that occasionally contributed to the migratory overseas role of the British Empire uh, from its establishment to this day. Um, the successful ending of his efforts was the recognition of the founder of the order and uh, his appointment as the first Grand Master since he was credited with the consolidation of Malta and the Ionian Islands within the framework of the British Empire. Uh, the drafting of the oldest constitution was easier to deal with the geographical cohesion of the islands, whose citizens were to be honored by two Christian saints, St. Michael the Archangel and St. George, patron saint of England, following the pattern of the previous order of the Garter, the Thistle, St. Patrick and the Bath, this order was called Distinguished until it required the epithet, the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George, the Ospicium Meliovis Avis, was chosen as a motto of the order, which could be described as a token of a better age. Um, but to me, a better translation would be promise of better times. And consider it in historical and geographical context could be understood as an expression um, of the hope that the British protectorate promised better days for the Ionian Islands. Uh, to this day, the order has three ranks, Grand Cross, the Knight Commander and Companion. Uh, today, distinguished personalities, including heads of state and prime ministers from eight and other countries, rank among the members of the order. From the early 20th century, in 1906, the chapel of St. Michael and St. George off the South Isle of St. Paul's Cathedral in London is the spiritual home of the order. Uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II solemnly continues to visit periodically for the ceremonial service honoring current knights and officers of the order. Uh, the Duke of Kent was installed as the ninth Grand Master of the Order in 1968, and he celebrates the 53rd anniversary since his installation this year. Um, now, as far as the cultural life is concerned in the Ionian Islands, we need to uh, say that indeed, and, and there was a, a blossom in uh, education in particular. So in 1824, the Ionian Academy was the first Greek university of modern times, 
but was in operation in Corfu for 40 years, from 1824 to 1864, but is up to the union of the Ionian Islands with the Greek states. It was founded by the British Philelen Frederick North, Count of Guildford, who had established close relations with Corfu after his first visit years earlier in 1791, when the island was still under Venetian rule. Almost 20 years later, with the Ionian Islands under British rule, he conceived the idea of establishing a university in the island of Ithaki. In this university, students from all over Greece, as well as other Mediterranean and Balkan countries, would attend classes taught in Greek by Greek scholars. The aim of this project was to promote the intellectual development of the Greek nation and to provide an institution of higher education for all the young Greek scholars who up to that time had to travel abroad in order to attend European universities. The Ionian Academy produced a large number of graduates and many important intellectual figures. There was a university formed with very high aspirations and goals at an extremely difficult time, despite the fact that its founder was British and the Ionian Islands were a British protectorate. From the very beginning, Lord Guilford envisioned and finally established a Greek university. Under difficult circumstances, the Ionian Academy, the first modern Greek university, made a major contribution to higher education by offering its services to all Greeks and not exclusively to the inhabitants of the Ionian Islands. Uh, another impact the British protectorate had on the everyday life of Kofu was the monetary, the first monetary institution in the, in the islands. A decree of the eminent Senate of the Commonwealth of Ionian Islands was established um, we have the first Ionian Bank back in 1839 to finance trade between the Ionian Islands and Great Britain. This made the bank the oldest in Greece. Uh, it received a 20 year grant of the exclusive privilege of issuing and circulating banknotes for the Ionian Islands. This um, gave uh, a huge privilege to Kofiut, and there was officially recorded, and there was a, a, a really a surge on the trade index since commodities from Kofu could be easily sold to many parts of European ports and vice versa. Uh, the bank soon changed its name to Ionian Bank and initially only operated in the Ionian Islands, opening branches in Kofu, Zante, and Kefalonia the following year. Uh, in 1845, a year after the bank received the UK Royal Charter, uh, it established agencies in Athens and Patras and appointed special agents in Venice and Trieste. In 1864, the Ionian Islands united with Greece and uh, converted its agencies in Athens and Patras to full branches. Another major impact was the aqueduct of Commissioner Fred Ad, Frederick Adam in, on the island of Kofu. The, um, during the British occupation, in this uh, period, finds Kofu with known problems of water scarcity, especially for the poor people, taking tragic proportions, especially during the summer months when either the mills were not in operation due to lack of water, and so there was no flow. The, the British High Commissioner, Sir Frederick Adam, decided to give a definite solution to the problem by transferring to the city plenty of fresh drinking water from the source of Carteri and St. Nicholas in the area of Benitez. On October 18, 1830, in the Senate, he proposed the construction of an aqueduct in Benitez within 6.5 miles and at an altitude of 55 meters. And the project began, the, and the budget was, uh, the cost was nearly 20,000 pounds back then. So the Senate uh, anonymously accepted, unanimously accepted the proposal of Sir Adam and the water supply of the city from the new aqueduct began with a majestic ceremony in the Esplanade Square just 10 months later on August the 7th, 1831. This is the bastion of further other in front of the Palace of St. George St. Michael, as you can see here, to commemorate um, the <clears throat> all his efforts he did for the islands. <clears throat> so the fact that pure and clean water was imported to town for the first time was an event of huge 
importance for the citizens of Corfu. Also, uh, Fred, Sir Frederick Adam, he made several other projects. Uh, also, his wife was a local Corfu. And uh, indeed, he is there certain he was the most likable commissioner passed from Corfu under its uh, occupation by the British. Um, another milestone was the um, establishment of the Reading Society in 1836, based on the model of the uh, homonymous association of Geneva. It, its first president was the philosopher Peter Vrylas Armenis, uh, a very well known Freemason <clears throat> here in Greece. The early years of its function coincide with the liberal and liberating wave of Western Europe, a fact which uh, brands from the beginning the political ground on which it stands. The society becomes a pioneer in the national and in the national struggles as well as in those for the establishment of freedom and press of press and of the Greek language as the main language of the United States of the Ionian Islands. It also stands on the front stage of the movement, which will lead to the union of the uh, seven islands with Greece later on in 1864. In 1840, uh, we have the Philharmonic Society of Corfu, a landmark of the artistic life of the islands. Uh, in the picture, you can see myself as principal flutist of the Philharmonic Society, one of the processions that, that take place uh, every year. <clears throat> and actually, um, these um, um, Philharmonic Orchestra has participated at the well-known fest tattoo festival in Scotland years ago. Um, and uh, quite recently, we celebrated 180 years of continuous, continuous uh, existence on the cultural life of the islands. Um, nowadays, Corfu Island has uh, more than 20 Philharmonic orchestras contributing greatly to the musical education of the young people. After all, the Ionian Islands traditionally perform the role of blood donor of Greece in what regards music. Then we have cricket in Corfu. Uh, the earliest known date for a cricket mass in Corfu was <clears throat> April 1823 on St. George's Day. The, um, the Esplanade, the, the great um, space, uh, the, the square, a very big square, during the 50 years of the British protectorate, uh, was played there uh, regularly by members of the military garrison, visiting ships for the Mediterranean fleet and expatriates enjoying the hospitality of the beautiful island. It was not until 1855 that two local cricket clubs were formed, the big comprising the nobility and the small consisting of the many. During the past 30 years, intense competition has taken place between local clubs. <clears throat> what is not worthy is the fact that no other free admittance ground has been graced by so many distinguished test players from so many countries, to wit. Some names, those who are keen on cricket, Basin Oliveira from England, Rohan Kenhai and West Hall from West Indies, Kim Hughes from Australia, Eddie Butler from South Africa, and many more famous test players who turn out on the Esplanade at the height of their career. <clears throat> now, Kofu's most important famous <laughs> cricketing son was, of course, the late Prince Philip, twice president of the Melbourne Cricket Club and the Lord's Taverners, the 12th man. Now, this is the, the, the actual house where Prince Philip was born. It was the summer residence of the, of the Lord High Commissioner, Frederick Adam. Um, it's not far from the old town, it's a, nearly a stone's throw away. <clears throat> and uh, rumors say that he was born actually on, um, on a kitchen table years later. Now, uh, another element that uh, our brothers um, uh, gave to Kofu was the British cemetery. Between 1815 and 1865, there were two British cemeteries in Kofu, one on the present day site <laughs> on the Kofu Palace Hotel near uh, Palace of St. George, St. Michael. Uh, years later, the two cemeteries were amalgamated into one, following in uh, 1920 by the transfer of graves from the island of Paxos and in 1960s from the island of Ithaki and Lefkada. So they, these are cemeteries home 
to the graves of British soldiers and servicemen and women, some from the period of the British protectorate, but the majority from the two world wars and their families. It also contains the remains of people from various religious denominations, including German families who lived in Kofu, but were not allowed to be buried in the Catholic or Orthodox cemeteries. <coughs> Sorry. On Remembrance Sunday each year, there is a wreath bank ceremony for the fallen of both world wars. This is always very well attended, not only by local British residents, but also by many other nationalities residing on Kofu. <clears throat> and this is a, a picture of myself um, a few years ago. I was visiting the, um, the this cemetery out of curiosity because it was my first time being there. And <coughs> out of the blue, this, <clears throat> the, the, this stone from Malta it was an apocalyptic sight to me. So I came closer and after years of research, I, <clears throat> I found out that two brothers were buried there. The first one was uh, brother Coleman, uh, brother Coleman and Berg in, in um, <clears throat> Maiden Lodge number six seven seven, in which Coleman and Berg were initiated, was consecrated on the fifteenth of July, eighteen sixteen, at the fifty-first Foot Regiment <clears throat> under the aegis of the United Grand Lodge of England and was part of the seven military lodges who were active during the period of the British protectorate in Corfu. The lodge took the name in remembrance from a very decisive role the 51st Foot Regiment played in the Battle of Minden, north of Germany on August the 1st, 1759, during the Seven Years' War of the Austrian Succession. <clears throat> this English lodge remained at the Ionian Islands more than any other British military lodge, initiating uh, nearly 35 soldiers and affiliating six others. Our brother, Edward Coleman, was born in 1787, serving the 51st Foot Regiment from 1822 as a private, and a year later was promoted to be a surgeon and died in Corfu the 2nd of October, 1823, at the age of 36. He was initiated in Freemasonry on the 4th of April, 1820, in Midland Lodge, passed a month later and raised on the 5th of June the same year while the lodge was still active in Portsmouth. On the memorial stone, there are engravings depicting craft and royal arts symbols, such as that of the 24th inch doge. Uh, let me draw up the picture for you. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> The gavel, the chisel, the square, the level, the triple toe, the pentathlon, while the sculptor Thomas Dobson wrote the following inscription in English. With the hope of a better world, I leave this world land. I lead my insignificance to the kingdoms of the light, and I lay my hands in the power of my savior. Stay, stranger, stay and sigh upon the grave of a soldier. For the passing wind may take your side and rejoice my late spirit. This I merely beseech from you. Now, um, we go back to uh, Pythagoras Lodge number 654 because this is uh, Sir Patrick Cotton, who we need, we must underline the innovative passing, but he, he had a, a, a very um, significant role uh, forming the um, judicial system on the Ionian Islands. He was the first one who uh, passed a law which granted freedom to all citizens of the Seven Islands uh, to form uh, communities, clubs, educate themselves, Women had the right to education, to work, and so on. Um, he was the worshipful master of Pythagoras Laws number 654, and he apparently became the chief justice of court uh, years later. And uh, of course, another element was the, uh, the freedom of press. Um, and he established the, as the dominant language, the Greek. This is a... Um, <clears throat> From the a paper of the 
of that period, the Ionia, Ionian Gazette. This is the English, the Greek language on the left, and the Italian on the right. It's dated, but it's from uh, the 14th of May, 1838. Uh, so Sir Patrick uh, Colton was a voice master from uh, Pythagoras Lords number 654 and the Knight Templar. He had joined Lords Pythagoras on the 4th of January, 1859 from Lords number 105, <clears throat> which was the number of the Lord Scientific in Cambridge. He was born in 1815 and was educated at Westminster School and St. John's College, Cambridge. He obtained his MA in years later in 1844 and his LLD in 1851. In 1858, he was appointed a member of the Supreme Court of Justice in the Ionian Islands, as I said before, and was knighted and appointed Chief Justice of the Court uh, a few years later. I presume that he must have left Corfu not long after um, 1864, where it was annexed to the Greek uh, government. Um, in England, he was appointed Grand Ch Chancellor of the Order of the Knights Templar, and by 16, 1868, sorry, at the latest, he was Provisional Grand Commander for Staffordshire and Warwickshire. He was a member of the Faith and Fidelity Encampment. Uh, some pictures depicting the first <coughs> uh, building were all um, the uh, Samuelsons, all, all, all the <coughs> were taking place. Uh, I have to admit it was very difficult obtaining information because you should bear in mind that um, unfortunately Kofu um, was devastated by the two world wars, especially in the Second World War, there was an air raid by Germans. So <clears throat> there are very, very few, um, um, let's say, very few um, books um, and um, uh, warrants that uh, were, can be found uh, on um, private libraries. And it's very difficult for a researcher to, to have <clears throat> access on the library of the Grand Lords of Greece. It was very difficult for me to find information. <clears throat> now, this is the summer, royal summer residence where Prince Philip was born. This is actually the, the table in which uh, he was born in 1921. <clears throat> Some pictures from the newly established museum in Corfu, uh, dating back to the uh, Venetian era when the first lodge was formed in 1782. So well, thank you, and uh, hopefully I'm waiting everybody in Kofu Island whenever you like to show you around <laughs> all those things we discussed today. Thanks for, for your patience very much. Brother Dimitris, James Papa Giorgio, thank you so much for giving us all a really interesting presentation on what we would probably all think is a, a holiday destination, a holiday island. And uh, I'm sure many of us have been surprised with the, the, the long-standing Masonic connections that you've shared with us this evening. Uh, I do know that there's a couple of questions have been put into the chat there, uh, Dimitri. So let me just go to that. Uh, but a couple of people have had to log out because of broadband and visitors. Uh, and uh, the first comment, Brian, is uh, he, a little bit of self-depreciating from himself. Th those Maitlands get everywhere, yes. James, we, we apologise to you because we've got the, 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 the current layered Maitland with us. Uh, mm -hmm. And he'll now think that that statue's about him uh, or that, that little temple's about him. But we'll put him right later on this evening uh, about that. But Alan, you're right, you Maitlands do get everywhere. Uh, back to the serious stuff, though, Michael Hearn, uh, Lane's Masonic records for the English Constitution uh, are viewable online, and they detail that Integrity Lodge number 5 to 8, the 14th Regiment of Foot, was raised on the 5th of August, 1890, and Pythagoras Lodge number 447 was raised on the, 16th, uh, the 6th of June, 1894. 
Uh, John Belton, uh, fascinated by the Union Band Certificate. The Knight Templar priests operated under a Union, ma under a union Band. It meant they only needed enough to open and wherever they wanted. Yes. Uh, Gerald O'Donnell, great lecture tonight. Uh, Robert Clark visited the islands a couple of times. Uh, Alan Turton, James, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. So we've not actually got any questions as yet, Brian. This is uh, quite unusual for you. Is uh, uh, the winter nights dragging in? And, uh, or has James just blown us all away with that story about Freemasonry on Corfu? Uh, yes. So in, in, in a few lines, uh, to make a long story short, is that um, these days uh, there was not uh, Greece was not even a nation. Um, we were under the Ottoman Empire, so as you may <clears throat> assume, we, we the Greeks didn't have the <clears throat> ability to um, follow their um, um, their beliefs. Um, um, the religion, um, they had little access to um, to knowledge. So only the Ionian Islands had the privilege to flourish those years. And um, indeed, uh, um, when the, the British came, um, the Ionian Islands and Kofu in particular uh, saw a really surge of <clears throat> uh, warfare. And uh, I forgot to mention that most of the infrastructure, I mean, uh, with the aqueduct and the palaces and uh, the old fortress, they built uh, some um, with the Ionian University, the um, Philharmonic Society and so on. Uh, a lot of lodges, um, Freemasons, <clears throat> they, did, they, they did the manual work. I mean, they, they were constructors. So uh, we owe a lot to our brothers back then. And um, I'm really privileged and honored to be a member of this fraternity, that which um, they um, they were very handy those days, you know. And we, me as a Corfield, as a Greek, I, I owe a lot to them. Yeah, thank um, you, James. <laughs> the, the, there's a couple of questions and a couple of more comments coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, Brother Dimitri. It's very enlightening. Ian Walk asks, was Corfu occupied during World War II? Uh, well, <clears throat> we had, yes, it was occupied by the Italians. Uh, there were for uh, six months, <clears throat> but uh, there was deployed a power from the, the, the uh, from uh, British. There was uh, the Irish, Scottish, and Englishmen, they, they were members of a cruise ship that uh, there was a, um, a kind of a naval fight, and it only lasted for six months. But during these six months, uh, there were a lot of bombardments. And as you know, many testimo testimonies were scattered. So uh, there was a big library where um, <clears throat> uh, interesting books 200 years ago were kept, they were destroyed, they were on fire. So as I said before, only minor um, volumes of books uh, were saved at the houses of <clears throat> some uh, collectors uh, in, as, as individuals. And most of the um, warrants and uh, um, certificates I tried to retrieve were from private collections of non-Masons. Yeah, they didn't know actually what was about. They didn't know the existence and the significance of those papers. Yeah, <clears throat> interesting that they were in private hands as well, Demetrius. Uh, Alan Maitland, very interesting presentation. Alan Turton asks, which groups built the aqueduct? Well, <clears throat> the aqueduct, uh, iconic recent survey, <clears throat> was built by uh, um, some brothers from Busaka Lodge, uh, from the um, Irish encampment. And uh, later on, they, um, we had the, um, the, the help of the Pythagoras Lodge, which um, nearly 90% were uh, British um, citizens. Uh, they had the knowledge, the know-how, how to build the aqueduct and so on. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, 
Hey, uh, Tony says, excellent and very informative presentation. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, Ian McIntosh, interesting lecture. Thanks for that. And the British Connections, I, an island I had no knowledge about. I, Sandy Thompson, how many operative lodges are now on the island? Uh, is, can you give us an indication of growth or decline of Freemasonry on Corfu just now? Yes, um, Kofu, as I said, was um, had the privilege to um, host the first lodge in the, let's say, the Greek territory nearly 200 years ago. So um, since the 1950s, the island of Kofu was, um, in comparison with other regions in Greece, had at least 10 lodges with uh, almost 10% of the populations were Freemasons. Uh, but in 1986, um, there was an incident um, that Athens, uh, as the capital of Greece, who wanted to have all the credentials and um, they wanted to, to acquire the historical building from the uh, courtyards and they refused to give access to the to, to the, the headquarters, which were in in Athens, there, so um, they went alone. They 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 didn't. They, they there was um, like a divorce, let's say, and they remained um, <clears throat> with not any official uh, grand lodge. Um, three years later, um, there was a coalition. And uh, they became under the Grand Lodge of Greece again. But nowadays there is a, a big decline uh, on the quality of members, let alone the number of members. Uh, nowadays the island of Kofu has approximately 100,000 people and nearly 200 people are Freemasons on the island. Uh, unfortunately, the same occurs with, uh, in Greece, um, although the main problem lies, to to be honest, uh, this is irrelevant to the um, to my talk, but I think lies to the um, to our um, religion because you know Greek Orthodox is they're very conservative and um, in a way they see us as a rival because you know we do donations so the Greek Orthodox Church they, they do donations as well so this is a very crucial point for us. We don't have the um, <clears throat> the freedom to express ourselves. I mean, uh, we are like a cursed society to say we are Freemasons. So um, nowadays, Kofu has uh, five lodges that they operate twice a month. There's an English-speaking lodge, uh, Lord Byron, an Italian-speaking lodge and French-speaking lodge, and uh, Two other lodges. The, the one operates uh, with the emulation ritual in the Greek language, and the the, the first lodge is Phoenix Lodge, is the oldest lodge in the the newly formed Greek uh, <clears throat> territory. Phoenix Lodge number one, which has the the equivalent of the Scottish standard ritual in in, in Greek. Okay, thanks, Dimitris. That's really enlightening. I. David Brown, excellent lecture, uh, fascinating insight into masonry and society in Corfu and the Ionian Islands during this little known, at least little known to us in the UK period. Uh, John Belton, it seems that those in power all really like Corfu and its people and worked hard to develop culture and learning. So enlightened empire, uh, slightly yes, tongue in cheek, but yes. yes. I, so just, uh, I, I forgot to really thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, brother Alan Turton and John Belton, because they gave me really some uh, useful information as far as the, 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 the Irish part of the British protectorate, how they gave me really insight and um, some uh, facts that really helped me. And because I'm preparing another, another paper, um, how the Iris, along with the Scots, uh, formed um, different aspects in the, on the islands. 
because the Irish, uh, they constructed things and uh, I recently discovered there were some Scottish lodges on the islands. They stayed for a few months and then went to Malta. And this has really significant on the well-being of the island. Well, so thanks again, Brother Alan and John. Well, we very much look forward to listening to that paper in the future, mm -hmm. David Trace. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about Brother Alan, who's a, a, our past master at Internet Lodge and also our past master here at the Lodge of Karachi. And he, he's laid down a bit of a challenge for you. Uh, when you go into the chair of Internet Lodge, will we be touring Corfu with a wee yeah, smiley absolutely. face? You see, yes. so... Uh, Robert Clark uh, just read an article in the Arena magazine from January 2020, uh, usually about the Polytechnic Lodge visit to Corfu. So Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I have to say that my father, <laughs> this is quite a, re a real, uh, I don't know, coincidence. He, 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 he was a student at the uh, Polytechnic College back in the 60s. And um, I, the, the insignia of the Lord is the same, with, I think it's St. George with a dragon. Uh, so I was very moved to see that Polytechnic Lodge visited the island of Kofu in, yes, a few years ago. And uh, it was um, the Lodge Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix Lodge hosted the event. Right, lovely. I'll see if I can find that article and put that up on the Facebook pages, mm -hmm. Brian. But I think that that's just come to, to the end of the, the comments and questions. So at this time, Dimitris, uh, it's only fitting that once again, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, our lockdown lecture, uh, our uh, office bearers are members, but more importantly, uh, our visitors here this evening to our weekly lecture series, uh, I, I thank you. Uh, very much for, for bringing us this very lovely story about the beautiful island of Corfu, uh, one that I very much want to go back to uh, now that I'm an adult and I understand a lot more than just making sandcastles on the beach, you see. So uh, hopefully in the near future, Dimitris. Uh, brethren, uh, next week, I, as it's a remembrance Tide Remembrance Week, uh, a couple of days before Armistice Day, uh, I've invited Brother Grant McLeod to come back to speak to us, and he's going to speak to us about uh, the military, travelling military lodges in the, the 19th century, so I felt that that was a, a nice connection for the, the week ahead, Brian, uh, so that's Brother Grant McLeod next Tuesday evening at 7pm and I hope many of you can come along and join us. Brian, at this time, please feel free to unmute and give your thank yous and congratulations to Brother Dimitris Papagiorgio or James, uh, as he likes to be called. Thank you, James. Dimitris, thank you for an absolutely superb piece of research and a wonderful presentation. It was lovely to hear it again. Well done, sir. Thank you, Brother Alan. I'm very obliged. Thank you so much for your kind words. <clears throat> thank you, Demetrius. That was very, very entertaining and delightful. Thank you. That was great. Brother James, thank Thanks, you Brother for Alan. an excellent uh, lecture. Opened my eyes to lots of things about Corfu. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you it, it's, great. It's, it's great because, it, <coughs> sorry, it's great because it's an unexpected story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, John, indeed. Yes, thanks. That's a lot, John. Thank you, brother James. James. That was very Thank enjoyable. You. Really enjoyed it. Right. I'd love to come to Corfu one day. Thank you. Yes, be my guest whenever you like. Uh, I have to tell you that I have an apartment which is uh, every year uh, 27, you know, 24 7. It's free for all brothers. Whenever you want to visit Corfu, just send me an email, a message and you will have the key to enjoy the beautiful islands. <laughs> it will be my pleasure to, to, to share uh, all this, you know, the beautiful feelings and uh, the, the, the natural, everything with you. It's, it will be my, my really, um, be, I'm very um, happy to uh, host you whenever you like. James, what a lovely offer. Thank you so much. Yeah, lovely offer. Marvelous gesture. Yeah. Well done again. Absolutely fantastic <laughs> presentation, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. And I'll give you five, Brian. James, absolutely superb. James. Many thanks, many thanks, brother. Ron, thank you. 
And well done, James. Everyone. Thank you very much. Well done. Marvelous, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks well done, James. And free, Brian. Thanks a lot. Thank Boy, you. You're still, Jimmy. And two. Thanks. And one, Brian. James, once again, thank you so much on behalf of all here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337. Mm -hmm. And Brian, 